the name of uh, the Lord to our church today. Um, a very warm welcome to you, especially as well as for visiting, or visiting for the first time in a while. It's great to have you with us. Uh, I trust you'll feel welcome and help today uh, being in our service. My name is Dan. I'm the pastor here of Christ Church Tyler's. We're a, a group of Christians who love to meet, to worship God together, and serve Him in this community. And it's lovely to have you in our service today. <clears throat> if you need the toilet, there are some out through that door on my right at the back, right round to the right. You can uh, uh, use those there. And today's service, well, it's a special service um, uh, as we um, sing together to God and praise Him and remind ourselves of what He's said to us. We're going to pray to Him. We're going to read from the Bible and hear him speak to us there too, and then hear a message from the Bible. Uh, we've also got Sunday school on today, children. That's going to be out through those double doors. That's for sort of ages 3 to 11. I say sort of. It sort of really is. You can't be like 16 and wonder. Okay. So 3 to 11, that'd be great. I'll let you know when it's time for you guys to go out uh, in just a moment. If after the service there's anything that's come up and you'd like to talk about it, uh, please, I'd love to have a chat with you, uh, or perhaps one of our welcome team, or maybe somebody you came with. Uh, I'd also like to draw your attention to, on the welcome sheet, uh, some advertising there for our Exploring Faith course coming up just after Easter. Um, a great opportunity. If you've got more questions, or you're searching or thinking about Christianity, who Jesus is, what life is all about, that course will be a great opportunity for you to... Uh, interact uh, over that stuff and ask those questions. So check that out, note the dates, and come and talk to me. I'd love to uh, make that uh, available to you. One more thing, uh, just to note, particularly for our regulars, um, on Good Friday, on Good Friday, we're going to have a lunch here at the church, at, at the school rather. So if you can make that, I know Easter, lots of families go away, things like that, but if you're around, it'd be lovely to commemorate the Lord's death for us together with a bit of a lunch. So that will be here on Good Friday, if you can make that. Let's uh, begin now our worship. I'm going to read a few verses from Psalm 103, and, and let these words help us start to hone in on God, to think about Him. Maybe you've had a busy rush morning, and you need just to quiet your heart. Well, maybe these words will help you think about God says this, praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Let's pray. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you again for this new day. And another opportunity for us to gather as your people, to remember you, to worship you and encourage each other. Please rest your blessing on us as we meet like this. We pray especially for those visiting with us or those new to Christianity who are just thinking about it. Help them, Lord. Help them to understand what you're saying to them today. Lord Jesus, we thank you that it is because of you that we can worship God at all. Lord Jesus, it is, it is because you died and rose again for us. Uh, that means we can be forgiven of all of our sin and have a relationship with you again. Lord Jesus, we thank you that there is forgiveness available to us all today and a warm welcome from you. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are with us now in our hearts to comfort us and encourage us and help us along. Lord, we're weary from the weak. We're burdened with many cares and sins, and we need your encouragement and comfort today. So Holy Spirit, come, help us, strengthen us, and give us your blessing. Receive our worship now. Let it do us good in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, we're going to stand and sing together our first song. It's called Blessed Be Your Name, and it's a song that reminds us that even, well, in the good times and the bad times, God is always good and worthy of our praise. So let's stand together, and our band will lead us in worship. something all right so you can't see the whole thing you can only see a little bit of it and see if you can guess just by looking at a little bit if you can guess what the whole thing is all right all right well let's see let's do some together and you might be able to oh that's a terrible picture isn't it the light doesn't help now these are really really hard deliberately really really hard can you can you make out what that might be or let's say who it might be let me give you a, a clue it's a character from a Disney film. Graham got it. He's like, oh, I got this, man. Go on, Lydia. 
Buzz Lightyear, shall we see? Yes, it is Buzz Lightyear, well done. Right, let's do another one. Ah, another character. <laughs> yeah, you know, come on, who is it? Yeah, Mater. Mater? Yeah. Yeah, Mater from Cars, well done. <laughs> yeah. He was straight, hands straight up, by the way. I have to say, yeah, I know that. Okay, who, ah, who could this be? Is this from another team? Jesse, do you know? Oh, who could it be? You know who it is, I know. Dougie! Dougie! Yes! Well done! Ah, who's this? Oh! Alright, who's, who's hasn't gone yet? Uh, Zahara. Bluey! Bluey! Yeah, it's one of my new favourites. Bluey's quite funny. Alright, let's see what else we've got. Let's see. Uh, oh, right, now this is an animal. That's a clue. This is an animal. A turtle? A turtle? <gasps> no, but good guess. Um, Esha? A snake. A snake? No, it's not a snake. One more guess. Should we do Samuel? Elephant. It is. <laughs> it's an elephant. It's an elephant. Well done. We zoomed in right here on the task. Well done, Samuel. He's seen many blurred elephants up close. So many, <laughs> must be a South African thing. <laughs> All right. That's so another animal. Who do you think she knows? Uh, Thea. An eagle? No, but very good guess. Yes. An owl. Another good guess. They've got eyes like, a bit like that, but it's not an owl either. It's even cuter. One more guess. Who's got it? Kenya? Yeah, look at that. Oh, well done. All right, uh, let's see. Now, uh, this is another animal, all right? This may freak some of you out, so please, please hold on to your seats, okay? Who thinks they might know what this is? Jesse, do you know? Snake. No, it's not a snake. Shall I tell you what it is? It's a spider. Yeah. All right, well, keep it up there long. Spider. No, 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 no. Now this is a place. This is a place. Now zoomed in on a place. Who knows what this might be? Grown-ups, what do you think? Clive. Tower Bridge. Tower Bridge in London. That's right. Here's another place. A bit closer to home. Who's, who, hand up, Tina, hand up. Yes. Forbury Gardens, that's right, the, uh, the line in Forbury Gardens, the, the War Memorial. Uh, it's quite interesting reading about that, it's very heavy, apparently. Um, <laughs> where's this? Where could this be? This is another place. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. All right, I'll tell you this. This is quite hard. But so, Harry, what do you think? It does, there might be some water. I'll show you what it is. It's the earth! It's the world! The world in which we live. Now, why am I showing all of that? You know, it's hard to see the big picture when we're zoomed in really close, doesn't it? Isn't it? Now, you were very good at kind of guessing some of those, but sometimes life is a bit like that, I think. We can't see everything that's going on around us. We don't know everything. And sometimes we can only see what's happening in our lives just right in front of us. We don't know what the big picture of our life is all about. So that means when life is hard, when bad things happen and sad things happen, sometimes we're left scratching our heads and thinking, we can't see what this is all for. What's this all about? It just seems so, so terrible. We don't always know why. It's like we're zoomed in and we can't understand what's going on. But God knows. God knows. God always sees the big picture. Children, you might remember who this character might be from the Bible. That is... Who do you think it is, Lydia? Daniel, no, it might be, but good guess. Who said? Joseph. Did you say Joseph? Yeah. You said Joseph, good lad. It is Joseph. Now, Joseph, he had a pretty rough time. You remember this, don't you? He was thrown into a pit by his own brothers. Then they sold him in as a slave off to Egypt. He was falsely accused there. He was imprisoned and he was forgotten about. 
left to rot and die. He suffered terribly. And I wonder if Joseph ever thought, what on earth is this all about? All this bad stuff and all this sad stuff in my life. I can't understand it all. Why God? Have you ever asked that question? But God did have a plan, didn't he? <laughs> Joseph, he had that gift, didn't he, of understanding dreams. And God used that in Joseph to elevate him until he became basically next to Pharaoh in the land. He was elevated and lifted high and given, given all of this power. And then he was able to use that power to save his own family, even his own brothers who were starving in a famine. All of that bad stuff so that God could actually do something good. And God always knew that. He saw the big picture. In fact, Joseph said this to his brothers. You intended it to harm me, but God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. We may only see a little bit. And it may be hard and bad and sad. We can trust that God sees the whole picture. He knows what's going on. You know, this is just like Jesus, isn't it? Joseph is like Jesus. Jesus suffered on a cross. Jesus died, in fact. And you can look at Jesus dying and think, what's that all for? But it was God's plan. He saw the big picture that through Jesus dying for us, he could save us, just like Joseph saved his family. So I want to say to you children and all of us here today to remember this really. We may not know all that God is doing. We may only see a small part of the plan. But we know that because of Jesus, in the end, it will be for good if we trust in him. Shall we pray together? Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you that you love us. That you have a plan and a purpose, even for our suffering. Lord, we may not be able to see it. We may be too close to it. But we can trust you that you know. So we thank you so much. We thank you for Jesus, who died for us and rose again. To save us from our sin and from our suffering. Thank you that because of Jesus we have the hope of a brand new life with him. Without suffering. So Lord we're sorry. We're sorry for when we don't trust you. Especially when we suffer. We're sorry for relying on ourselves and our own abilities and gifts and strength to get us through these daily challenges. Instead of relying on you. So please, help us to remember your love and trust in your goodness, especially when we struggle and suffer. Lord, we pray that you would please be with those who are suffering today, those here in this church, those who are ill, who have cancer, who are struggling with their mental health, who are facing deep emotional pain, perhaps from abuse or trauma, for those struggling in their families and relationships. For those grieving the loss of loved ones and missing them so much. Please comfort and strengthen and help each one of us here today. We would also pray, O oh Lord, that you would please bring peace to our world. Places like the Ukraine where there's so much suffering today. Those who are ill with COVID, perhaps, give them healing and grace. Well, there is so much suffering. But our hope is to look to you, O oh God, who can make an end of suffering. We, we look forward to the day when Jesus comes back and makes all things new. So in your name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to sing uh, another song. Children, this is one I know that we like. Um, and it's a song that's really this prayer that we know we can turn to Jesus and trust in him even when we struggle and even when we suffer. It's called Jesus, strong and kind. We can come to him.
and he encourages us to do that today. So let's stand together as we sing. <coughs> seconds to leave and Paris will come back and then we'll continue.
Good. Neil. This is Neil, everybody. I've asked Neil to come and share a little bit. You stand behind there. Thanks, Neil. Do you want me to move this? Yeah, I'll move this out of the way. <coughs> good. I thought it'd be good uh, in a service like this just to hear from different folks in our church just about their story of being followers of Jesus and what that means to them and, and how that might relate to some of the things we're talking about today. We're thinking about suffering, life, why is it so hard? That's one of the things we're going to talk about a bit later. And I, I thought I'd ask Neil to, to give us some insight on that. But Neil, tell us a bit about yourself, family and so on. Right. Um, okay, so yeah, most of you know who I am. So and as you know, I'm a, a visitor to this country. <laughs> having celebrated the victory of uh, the Australian women's uh, cricket team this morning. <laughs> That's great. Uh, uh, yeah, normality has been maintained. <laughs> no, but uh, all right. Um, yes, uh, just on, um, one of the things uh, in speaking you, to you today is one of the things I would hope to do is just to encourage uh, the Christians among, among you to um, uh, go on in your faith, be stronger in your faith and be able to cope with uh, little things which come along in our way. Um, so, uh, anyway, I, I was um, brought up in a non-Christian home. Uh, my father was quite an atheist. Um, uh, my mother was uh, what she described herself as a retired Roman Catholic. Uh, very superstitious. But um, I, I, in the grace of God, um, uh, I came into contact when I, when I was in secondary school with uh, uh, the Scripture Union and their school camps uh, during the summer holidays and through that I heard the gospel and then and by the time I finished secondary school I had sort of worked out okay what is sin um, but you know going into university my uh, faith began to come together as a 18 year old or something like that all right now um, Dan's asked me to sort of weave together some little bits of my story with some recommendations about some of the books at the back to encourage you to do it so what I'm going to do is sort of now sort of launch into when I'm about 38 to 40 years old and as a Christian then I'm going to put to you now as some of you are in that slot of 38 to 40 years old I want you to put you in a slot where you say okay you, you, you may as I did at that time own a very nice rifle that was a German one <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you can imagine. The thing of yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, know, I thought I'd get a really relatable guy. <laughs> you can really put yourself in it. The point of this is, you know, uh, being as, a, as I am uh, a geologist and working in the Australian bush, it's not un unusual to have such a um, tool. Uh, but uh, when uh, I had a, a very uh, a bleak time in my life and. Uh, uh, I had to say to myself, I must not take this rifle with me in the field because of the danger I'd blow my brains out. Um, it was quite dark, um, but I was a Christian. Right? So as a Christian, I'd got, I was in that situation. Uh, much of it, uh, not, in a, not a situation I would in any way choose. One doesn't choose oneself to, to be in that situation. Um, here, you could say uh, equally, uh, I can remember thinking I could, I could just let go and fall back into a great black abyss and allow a nervous breakdown just to wash over me and I wouldn't have to worry anymore. You know, so these are things where, you know, where I was, um, uh, you, we sang in our song, didn't we? Uh, um, he gives and takes away. Okay, now a question for you lot. You can't go see. Where in the Bible does that come from? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What's my favourite book? Okay, it is from Job, of course. Very early in Job. And But, you know, the thing is, uh, as a Christian, with the world falling apart, when the Lord in his providence took away everything, I had a suitcase with some clothes in it, that's bad. <laughs> Responsibilities. But you know, basically everything. Um, and you, you, you think to yourself, you know, in there, what is the Lord doing? But what do you do as a Christian in these situations? Now, I did find some things very helpful. Now, one, some of that, I'm going to show there's some, some books I read. Right? Now, here's a nice, this, this one here by um, a Puritan, right, written in about 1600 and something or other, 
all things for good. You know, the title kind of gives you the, the, the message to you as a Christian. Okay, the Lord means to... And what is the verse that is drawing upon? Who can remember the verse? Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. Okay. For those that love the Lord, he works all things for good. Now, this one, the mystery of providence. The Lord brings into our lives things which we have no idea what's going on. This really, really, a, a, you know, a, a very beneficial book. Now, um, why are these, uh, 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 a third one, right? Now, this is one which I'm, I hope will, this is called The Crook in the Lot. And what is that about? I'm going to read, now this is, this is really in Puritan language, right? And, it's, and here, here it writes, he's writing from Ecclesiastes as, a, as his starting verse. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 13. Consider the work of God. For who can make straight that which God has made crooked? So the crookedness is something which God himself puts in every one of our lives. As saints, right, our lives will not run like this, in the way we think. The Lord in his providence will put something crooked in your life. That will be a trial where you will be called upon to consider from the depths of your being who you are, who God is. And you may be in a situation where you think you, you have to try to make sure, as a Christian, you are not allowed to blow your brains out, or whatever. Um, now, um, the, the key thing about this particular type of book, if you open them up there, are a little, the latter ones are quite difficult to, to read because of the English, but it, they're scripture, and they're scripture, and they're scripture, and they're scripture. These writers of this period of time, they just saturated what they were preaching on and what they wrote with scripture. The Bible, the Bible, the Bible. Now, who knows that TV program, which is sort of location, location, location. For a Christian, where he stands in, in the course of everything is the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. That is the thing which tells us, helps us to know where we are in space and time. The Bible comes to you with verses like the ones we've sung this morning and reassures us. And we come back to the character of God. God is good. He can do Nothing that is not good. And so everything he does to me, and he will do to you, can only be good. He can only be just. And you take hold of that. You know that as a Christian is true. He can only do what is just. He can do nothing which is unfair. He is full of grace. He intends all good things for your purpose. So you can put your trust, go back to those foundations. When your world is falling apart, everything you had thought was important, is gone. Go back to the scriptures, the scriptures, the scriptures. All of the promises of God which we have sung about. I know I've talked to some of you and you said, my life has been really easy. And I'm thinking to yourself, oh, I've got some news for you, Master. The Lord is going to do things where he will strip the worldliness out of you. Um, at the same time these guys were writing... These guys, this is a little story, now this is about biographies, the little message I have here is, bi biographies can be very, very helpful to you. They are good things to read now, so you prepare for later. At the time these other books were being written in the, in the 1600s, there was a whole bunch of dudes in, in, in Scotland who were being martyred. Um, and in this little book here, this story of 13 people and their lives and where they stood. And I'll tell you, that was a book, when I was um, having trials, that brought tears to my eyes when I said, no, you know, I've got to go this way. Now, I'm going to read you a little bit. This is another little biography, right? It's about a guy named Georgie Vince, and the leader of the Reformed Baptist in the Soviet Union, when the Soviet Union existed, and it's titled Three Generations of Suffering. Now, um, this guy here um, in... April 1969, is in a um, labour camp. Um, it's called Anusha Corrective Labour Camp. And, uh, you know, he says... Basically, he's committing his life into, into Christ because he's, he's, he's shortly to be released. 
but uh, he's, he, he basically says, the end of my sentence is approaching. Well, I've lost the height of it. Yes, and he, he's, he, he re realises, you know, that he's, he's a, he says, the end of my sentence is approaching. They try to frighten me with, with a new sentence. They say that I will not reach my home, that they will arrest me again on the way there, and so on. And anyway, he basically is released. He goes home, and he reaches home in about May 1969. Next chapter starts. On the 1st of December 1970, a little bit over here, my mother was arrested in Kiev. It happened in the evening. She was in the home with uh, my children, my youngest children. <laughs> After she had uh, dressed and got ready to be taken by the authorities, my eldest daughter came, came home. Their grandmother was very calm and cheerful. She prayed. Anyway, she's taken off to uh, Kharkiv, right on the eastern side of uh, um, wherever, uh, <laughs> the Ukraine, and, and there she's in prison. Now, the, the reality is, there's three generations here of general. Her husband had been previously, this, this woman's husband, um, Georgie Finn's father, had been taken into um, uh, prison 20 years earlier uh, and had died in prison. She had never, he was taken away much the same way as she was. And um, uh, the key thing is, these people are suffering immensely as Christians because of the actions of other people. We do not know, as Dan said, the beginning of, from the end. These guys did not know the beginning of the end of what was going to happen with the gospel in the Ukraine. We see now stories of, of um, young Baptist men driving from that far eastern side of, um, of the Ukraine into Poland, picking up some and driving back um, at huge risk to themselves. The Lord is working his purpose out. We do not know where he, what he's intending to do. We are called to be um, uh, sacrificial, to, to, about, to behave as the scripture tells us to behave in the trial that we are facing. So that when we get a little bit older and we get into our 70s and we have to face another trial, um, we think, wait a minute, I have found a, a saviour who will always, who's faithful to me, he has, he has always been loving and kind to me throughout the things that have happened behind. You might, I, I'll finish now. That you will, I urge you, if, if you are in the sort of 30, 40s slot, prepare now for the trial which is going to come to you. The Lord will shape that exactly as you need it, but it is going to come. And eventually you will be like me and you'll be looking down the barrel and saying, okay, how much longer have I got to live? Is that ultimate question for every single one of us. Well, anyway, that, you, thanks, <laughs> thanks. Uh, there is a whole bunch of books I'll put at the back there which uh, may help you if you are encountering a whole range of trials and suffering now. Sorry. Thank you, bro. Thank you. <laughs> one of the things Neil will often say if you get talking to him, um, and you're never quite sure what he's going to say next, but one of the things Neil often does say <coughs> is nothing by accident, nothing by chance. Uh, Neil has shown us again and again his faith in a, a God's providence. And I know it's strengthened Neil to read these biographies of others who've gone before, so helpful in learning from others and their experiences of these things. So thank you, Neil, for sharing. Um, and yeah, do check out the book show, uh, the book's uh, stall at the back. It's all free, you can borrow stuff or whatever. Um, but we're going to read now from the Bible, Scripture, 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 from Mark chapter 15. So if you've got a Bible, it's going to go and do it again. Words are there on the screen, Mark chapter 15. And this is an account of the suffering of Jesus. It says this, the soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. 
and they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. It's mockery of Jesus. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice on the charge of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means... My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the, <clears throat> those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. As a, past a pastor, I'm often called upon to walk with people through some of the hardest times of their lives. Bereavement, or tragedy, or trauma, or abuse, or cancer, or the loss of a job, depression, and so on. I'll never forget conducting three funerals for the same family in the space of four months. And one of those deaths was actually a suicide on the day of one of the funerals. And this pandemic, hasn't it, has caused untold suffering to the whole world, uh, the effects of which will last many years. The war in Ukraine being the most recent of some 40 conflicts going on in the, the world today. The last century, uh, notorious for the, being the bloodiest in human history. And so far in the 21st century, it's been marked by terrorism and war and famine and natural disaster, economic collapse and a global pandemic. Things like the Me Too movement highlight abuse of women. There's ongoing concern about racism and poverty and exploitation and inequality. We're more divided than ever. We're more depressed than ever. We're more unhappy than ever. It's clear, isn't it, that life is hard. We've been thinking recently uh, as a church, doing this little series, Life Questions, uh, about some of life's big questions. Does life matter? That's one of the ones we've looked at. How can we find happiness? We're going to see that next time. What about death? And we're looking at what Jesus would say to answer some of these questions. And today we're looking at suffering. What is Jesus' answer to our daily, lifelong suffering? Now, this question is sometimes thought of as kind of like, you know, the torpedo against Christianity. And, and there is no denying, it is a hard question to answer. 
So on the one hand, there's this assumption that suffering must mean there's no God at all. I mean, how could a God of total power and love allow suffering and evil? But since those things obviously clearly exist, well, God must not exist then. Uh, but for all of this, I mean, it's more than just this kind of philosophical question, isn't it? It's deeply personal. The pain and anguish of suffering that we feel, well, sometimes that makes us doubt God's goodness. And if he does exist, well, he's not the kind of God I want to believe in. However, denying the existence of God because of this question doesn't get rid of the problem. In fact, it, I think it creates even more questions for us. For, for example, if there is no God, as uh, secularism teaches, if there is no God, what basis do we have for saying that anything is bad or good? Why should we be kind of so upset when bad things happen? And, and do we have a right to expect anything different? Uh, last week, we thought about the question, does life matter? Um, uh, in a secular worldview, in which there is no God, well, it tells us, no, life doesn't matter. Uh, we saw, didn't we, uh, Richard Dawkins, that atheist uh, and scientist, he says this, quote, In a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe is precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. Atheists like, like Dawkins tell us that life doesn't matter and therefore neither does your suffering. It doesn't matter. Suffering is just tough luck. Secularism only gives us a bleak view of the universe and no basis for compassion or empathy or care. It doesn't matter. So, so you might not believe in God yourself, but you still have to face the problem of evil and suffering. Now, some have turned to religion for answers to the problem. Perhaps uh, an Eastern religion like Buddhism uh, uh, is the answer. But um, Buddhism, well, that's about escapism. Suffering's just an illusion. We just need to escape it. We need to, therefore, eliminate feelings and desire. Feelings like love, even. It's not grounded, that, though, in the real world, is it? It also teaches that suffering, while it's part of karma, you're getting what you deserve. Why feel sorry for someone getting their karma? What about Islam? Another big religion. What about Islam? Well, suffering is the will of Allah. Uh, don't expect an explanation or a reason. It's just part of God's plan and will, and you must simply accept it. You've got to submit to God. And there's certainly no way, absolutely, in Islam that Allah would suffer himself. Allah's distant. He's removed from our suffering. He's far above it, up in his ivory tower somewhere. But how could he really understand then, or sympathize with us, or even comfort us truly? Well, what about Christianity then? What does Jesus have to say about it? Well, I think Christianity offers us the best and most compelling answer because it firstly it embraces the reality of suffering in our lives and then transforms it. Suffering, in fact, can lead us even closer to God. You see, suffering in Christianity isn't just one of those sort of sticky, inconvenient questions around the edges of Christianity that we don't like to talk about that makes us a bit nervous. No, suffering is at the very heart. It's the epicenter of our faith. None other, in fact, than in a cross. That is the, the sign and symbol of our faith. A symbol of suffering and crucifixion, of death. It's Jesus' cross. Now, we've just read, haven't we, from Mark's account of the crucifixion and death of Jesus. And, and I believe, as we look there, right into the heart of it, not away from it, not embarrassed by it, not try and cover it up, but explain it away. If we look right into the heart of the cross, we have our answers. 
we find why life is so hard and how it can be made right in the end. In the cross, we see the cause of suffering, we see its purpose, and we see its end. Let me explain these a little bit. Life is hard, but the cross shows us why. Here's the first thing. The cross shows us why. It's really hard, isn't it, when we're feeling ill uh, and uh, we don't know why, right? Uh, we end up, uh, we were talking about this, Clive, we end up scouring Google looking for answers, right? Uh, I'm, I'm not very well. What are my symptoms? Type them in. What do you get? Uh-oh, there's a thousand terrible reasons you could be ill, and they're all going to end in death. All right, so now not only are you in pain and you don't know why, you're overwhelmed with terror at what might happen. By the way, don't search Google for your symptoms, all right, basically. Um, but it's also important, isn't it, as well, that we find out the right diagnosis of what's going wrong so that we can get the right cure. And when it comes to suffering, our world often, I think, misdiagnoses the problem. Well, you know, suffering, well, it's because of inequality or a lack of education or capitalism or socialism or religion or any number of things. And so the answer must be then more equality or, or more education and so on. But the Bible tells us, the cross tells us, they're, they're not the cause of suffering. They, maybe they're more like the symptoms, in fact. There's a deeper reality here. Here it is. The cause is actually us. It's our own sin. And the cross shows us this. The Bible's crystal clear. The reason Jesus died was because we are sinful. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He himself, that's Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the cross. Sin is uh, it's, it's our rebellion, turning against God who made us. Its origins are from the very, very beginning with the first humans. They turned away from God to go their own way. They rejected his love and they broke his law. And now every human since, every generation has continued to live in that rebellion. The, the problem is in our heart. It's in our nature. We've read from Mark and earlier in Mark, Jesus says in chapter 7, For from within, out of men's hearts... Come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. What a list. All these evils, he says, come from inside and make a man unclean. Suffering isn't God's fault. The Bible says it's ours. There's an evil inside of us in our very natures. And you can deny it all you like, but we are all capable of the most heinous evil. Well, okay, you, you know, you might say, well, I can see how suffering comes from things people do, evil things people do, but what about other kinds of suffering? What about a tsunami? What about cancer? Well, the Bible also tells us that our sin has impacted on creation itself. Um, the very world in which we live and, and the bodies we live in, these, these are all once good. But now they're also under the effects of sin. They groan with pain, the Bible says. When that first man, Adam, when he uh, sinned in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, it says, God cursed the ground because of him. You see, man was, was made to rule and, and bless his uh, creation, this world that God had made, that these bad choices in rebellion dragged the world down with him as well. I mean, surely you can see that, right? One man's... Um, choices and decision and misery for all. I think a bit like uh, Beauty and the Beast. Have you seen that film or that story? In that story, there's this prince and, and he's proud and hard-hearted and he, he's cursed. Um, and upon him, this curse falls and also all his castle and all his subjects fall with him. In, in this story, we are the beast. And the world is our cursed castle. So if we're asking, listen, if we're asking God to end suffering, that means he must end us. Judge us. But he hasn't. Not fully, not yet. In fact, the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that he is patient with you. 
not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God is patient with this world. Waiting until you turn away from that sin and trust in Jesus. That's what the cross is about. Jesus suffers and dies because of sin. Sin is the reason for suffering. And the cross is God's way of providing our escape. It doesn't mean that every single uh, way you suffer is directly linked to some specific sin that you've done. That doesn't necessarily link either. But in general... That is the reason. And the cross is God's way of providing our escape. But more on that in a moment, because there's more to our suffering than simply the result of sin. In God's amazing wisdom, suffering has a purpose too. And though life is hard, the cross shows us what suffering is for. When we suffer, we can't seem to help but hope there's a reason for it. As we said, despite what some atheists say, meaningless suffering is unbearable. There must be a purpose. But some suffering is so terrible, so horrific, we can't imagine there being a good purpose to it. But, but let's, again, look at the cross. There's an answer here. Jesus' suffering was truly horrific. If you read all of Mark chapters 14 and 15, for example, you'll see the horrendous way Jesus is treated before his excruciating death by crucifixion. It was an agonizing suffering, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. Uh, chapter 15, verse 34 says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, bearing the sin of the whole world under God's judgment, is even somehow, as the Son of God, forsaken by the Father. But, but look, here's our point. It was all for a purpose. Our salvation, his horrific suffering, was for an infinite good for others. And, and it's not only in the cross we see this. All through the Bible we see this story repeated. Um, God using suffering to bring about a greater good. We talked earlier, didn't we, about Joseph's life. Uh, being an, another example of that. Um, you see it um, simply it doesn't follow that an all good, an all powerful God could not allow suffering. It doesn't necessarily follow. It is possible that God has morally sufficient reasons for suffering. And just because you can't see the purpose or reason doesn't mean there isn't one. Our view might be too small, remember. So think of a surgeon who has to inflict horrendous wounds on somebody in order to bring about their healing. I'll never forget taking my daughter Thea, when she was just a baby, to go and get her jabs. And the, the cries, yeah Thea, she knows what I'm talking about, Phoebe. Uh, the cries, that look of horror on her face, how could you do this to me? But it was for her good. There are some good reasons. So yes, a good and loving God can allow suffering because he has some greater purpose for it. In the Bible, there are lots of things we could say. Maybe it's for a warning to people, a way to kind of get their attention and wake them up to their sin and so that might turn back to God. Suffering can teach us. It can refine us. It can even discipline us. We learn the lessons from it so that in future, maybe we don't make the same mistakes again perhaps, or, or we learn about our mortality and fragility so that we depend on God more. There are lots of reasons God uses suffering. Now listen, I can't tell you exactly why you are suffering now specifically. Sometimes we just don't know. But what we do know is that a loving God allows it for greater purposes. And the cross reminds us of this. The cross shows us this. And we can trust him. Romans 8 verse 28 says, this is what Neil was mentioning to us. And we know that in all things, even suffering, God works for the good of those who love him. There's a purpose. But before we leave this point, I think there's something else the cross of Jesus teaches us about the purpose of suffering. The, the cross 
shows us that Jesus suffers with us. God the Son came into our world. He became a human like us and he lived a genuine human life, which included the same kinds of trials and sufferings we all experience. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, tells us that Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses. He's not unable to sympathise. Hebrews 2, verse 18, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So here's what's so unique about the Christian faith is, it, is, is that God has chosen to enter into our suffering, to relate to us in the most fundamental ways. Jesus truly knows he's not far off, but he's near to us in our suffering. Maybe you've suffered tremendously, and part of the pain of that is sometimes this feeling like nobody knows. Nobody gets this. I'm all alone in this suffering. I'm forgotten. And that can make suffering even worse. But on the other hand, to be with somebody who you feel knows and does understand, maybe because they've been through something similar, well, that's incredibly comforting. You can be in the room with somebody like that and you don't even have to say a word to them. They just know. They get it. And their words of comfort seem to feel so much more important to us. Dear friend, Jesus knows your suffering. And more than that, he overcomes suffering too. And like Hebrews says, he's able to help us through our sufferings. I've been there. I've done it. I've got the t-shirt, Jesus says, and I can take your hand and I'll lead you through with me too. He knows. So Jesus' sufferings actually demonstrate the true extent of his love for us. How far he was willing to go for us. I heard this, uh, this week, the story of um, uh, Father Damien uh, from the mid-1800s, uh, who went to be the pastor of a, a remote colony of lepers on the Hawaiian island of uh, Molokai. Uh, he lived with them. He cared for them. He, he dressed their wounds, he buried them, he pastored them, he served them, he preached to them. Until the fateful day when he unraveled his robes and then in his body he showed them the first signs of leprosy. And he addressed them then and he was able to say, We lepers. He'd become one of them. They knew he loved them. Then they knew that before he had leprosy. But now he's one of us now. He gets it. And we see how much he loves us. He was willing to give his life. And he died of leprosy. That is Jesus. One with us in our suffering. Demonstrating his glorious love for us. But here we come to the final point, And also one more reason Jesus had to suffer. Life is hard. But Jesus' cross shows us how it can end. Maybe you've been on a very, very long journey, right? Hours in the car or on a bus or a plane and, and you're uncomfortable, you're a bit claustrophobic, it's sweaty and smelly, you're a bit bored and you're tired out by the journey. But one thing you know that keeps you going is hope. Hope that eventually you'll arrive and the journey will end. A grueling, painful challenge is unbearable if we can't see the end of it. Especially if the only end we can see is really death itself and oblivion, meaningless, endless suffering is all we have if we don't have God. Now, Jesus didn't merely suffer like us and with us only to be some sort of good example or something like that. No, as we said, Jesus suffered and died for us as well in order to ultimately deliver us from our suffering and death too. Sin is the cause, but Jesus is the cure. 
By dying for us, Jesus takes the ultimate consequences of our sin and guilt on himself. He pays the debt we owe to God so we can go free. But then Jesus rose again from the grave. So now he's overcome death as well. Jesus overcomes suffering, he overcomes sin, and he overcomes death. All for us. So that by trusting in him, we, he can deliver us from them all as well. Of course, that may not be in this life. God never promises that. This is a fallen world under sin's curse. Remember, this life is marked by suffering. If you find relief from one thing, it won't be long until something else comes along. But for the Christian, we have hope that this life of suffering will end. And we will enter into eternal life and a brand new world without suffering anymore. Every wrong made right, justice complete. A good world. Everything good about this world, but perfected and more dazzling and beautiful and lasting. In fact, the Bible even says that our sufferings now as Christians will make our future life even more glorious. Just think of how you've enjoyed your day off after a very hard week of work. That day off is so much sweeter because of the hardness of the week. Life is hard, but our future is sweet. And it's not just a day off, it's an eternity. Of rest. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. The Christian hope is that yes, life is hard, but as hard as it gets, it's merely light and momentary. Maybe what you're going through now doesn't feel very light. It feels like it's going on and on and on. But the Bible says it's light and momentary compared to the things Jesus has in store for us. The Christian hope is that because of Jesus, who suffered on the cross for us and rose again for us, our suffering will end forever one day. And that no matter what we suffer in this life, it will all be worth it to have him Jesus says, listen, listen to this. Jesus comes to us today and he says, I am so good that I am worth all of your suffering now. <clears throat> now, there's a lot more that we could, we, could, we could say about this subject, but I hope I've given you a bit of a framework for how Jesus answers this question, why is life so hard? Jesus' own suffering on the cross clues us in to the cause the purpose and the end of all our suffering. Our world, our culture says suffering is meaningless. But Jesus says it isn't and that he alone can fix it. So all I can do now really is, is make an invitation to you. If, you. if you truly want to escape suffering, to have a real hope for your future and to experience life without this pain, then you need Jesus. I'm calling on you this morning to trust in him, admit your sin, believe he's paid for it, and ask him to deliver you. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that you willingly, lovingly chose to suffer with us and for us. We thank you that you have made a way for us to be set free from sin and have the hope of eternal life with you. That you will end all suffering one day. We pray these truths would comfort us all, filling us with hope and by your Holy Spirit have the strength to keep going. And oh Lord, if there is anyone here who has not yet found this life and hope in Jesus, please help them to understand and to believe. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
We're going to stand and sing a final song to close our service. And it's um, a comforting song that reminds us that whatever we go through in this life, God is with us. He's there for us. We don't need to fear when he's by our side. So let's stand together as we sing them. Please remain standing and I'll close us with a brief prayer. or even maybe someone to pray with you, I'd be delighted to talk with you, or perhaps the person you came with, or someone else from our welcome team. Now may the grace of God, 
and the love of Jesus and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.